Hey everybody, this is Harriet Kamuk, the host of Down to Earth, the show in which we talk about the issues that matter. And today on our show, I want to explore the topic with you, the qualifications of a leader. That's right, we're going to talk about what qualifies someone to be a leader and the expected qualities, or should I say, characteristics that we should observe of such a person and that will dictate to us how that person behaves, whether in the public sphere or in the private sphere. The reason we're talking about this is because in recent times in the church, in Christianity, in Christendom, we have seen people who have been elevated to positions of leadership and what else can we say? But it appears that they are behaving uncharacteristically the way their office and title dictate. So for reference, we must go to the scriptures and see what are the original dictates. What is it that God, Jesus, through Jesus, through Paul the Apostle, had told the church from the very foundation of the church, from the very beginning of the church, what is it that qualifies someone to be a leader and how that person was supposed to display those characteristics for the rest of us to see. So we're using for our exposition this morning, Titus chapter 1, and we're specifically looking at verses 5 to 9. And it's going to be eye-opening, I promise you. It is going to be eye-opening. Even I discovered some things about this that I never knew. For for years and years, there are some things that have puzzled us. And the Bible was very clear from the very beginning how this is going to happen. So we're going to get into that for just a minute. But first, if this is your first time watching this broadcast or listening to this, my name is Harriet Kamuk. I'm an author. I'm also an ordained minister and I am a speaker. I'm also the founder of the Exodus Foundation, an organization that we created to provide relief services for women fleeing intimate partner violence and fleeing human trafficking. So for more information, please go to our website, theexodusfoundation.com. There you will find more information about what we do and how we're in the fight to end violence against women and children and how we are in the fight to provide relief services for those in our community who cannot help themselves. This is an urgent situation. Homelessness is at an all-time high in our society. Economic factors, inflationary factors. It seems we really haven't recovered since 2008 and some of us are teetering on the edge and some of us have gone over the edge. So if you believe that this is something that you would like to be a part of and you can help, please feel free to go to our website to find out more information about myself. I am Harriet, as well as the Exodus Foundation. Thank you so very much for all that you do and for your continued support of this broadcast. By watching this broadcast, I thank you very much. Because, and for listening to this podcast, your support is integral to what we do. So turn with me in your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, you can download the Bible app to your devices. Yes, the Bible app is available from either one of the major uh, iOS devices or the Android devices as well. So go to the relevant Play Stores or App Stores for that. I believe, I hope I said that right. I'm surrounded by Millennials and Gen Z, so they keep me updated. Amen? So Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Scriptures. And I'm going to read it like this. It reads like this. It says, this is Titus writing to the people whom Paul has left him over. Paul the Apostle. The word Apostle there meaning he's chief minister to Christ. So Paul the Apostle, having proselytized around the, that part of the world, Greece and the kingdoms around, he left Titus, whom he refers to as his son. Not son in the biological sense, but son in the regeneration of the spirit. Son, the way you and I would say we are mentoring. Today we refer to that as mentoring. So Titus, so Paul is writing to Titus to give Titus instructions to relate to the people so that there can be no misunderstanding about who is called to be a leader and what qualities they should possess. So listen to how this reads. So in verse 5 it says, this is Paul writing to Titus. This is what Titus says. For this reason, I left you in Crete, Crete, in the area where they were, that you should set in order 
the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, in the King James Version here, the word elders is replaced by bishop. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. The word there in the King James Version reads rioting or uh, disobedience. Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For, in verse 7 says, for a bishop must be blameless. As a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I ask you now, Father, in the name of Jesus, let me decrease so that you will increase. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. I pray right now as this word goes out that it is received in the hearts of people, that people have clarity around those who are called to lead, that people begin to observe the qualities of those who are called and for those who do not fit these qualities that they step aside so the true leaders can emerge. I pray right now, Lord Lord God, that you, Jesus, are a high priest. You are the chief elder and that you are giving instructions to those of us so that we can step forward in the realm that you have called us to be in. I pray for people right now who need a miracle, who need an overturning of situation, who needs healing in their bodies, for people who need provision to come to them. I pray right now that you heal our bodies in every way that we hurt, that you provide for your people, Lord God Almighty, that you ease the anxiety and the depression that we are surrounded by. Lord God Almighty, answer somebody's call today for a job tomorrow. Someone is in desperate need of housing. Jesus, be a provider right now. Heal somebody who is wondering how they will pay for their medication right now in the name of Jesus. Answer the call of someone seeking a promotion, someone whose marriage is in trouble. Lord God Almighty, help us, oh God, surround us. Somebody who needs to get married. Jesus, you are our high priest. Bring people together whom you have called together and those whom you have called together. Let no man Put asunder in the name of Jesus. And we thank you this morning for this message as it goes forth, that it brings clarity to your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So what are the qualifications of a leader? We just read right here in the scriptures. This is the word of God. This is the Holy Scriptures. This existed before you and I. This was written more than 500 years ago by King James. It was in 1600, I believe 1671 or 1611, when King James commissioned the rabbis in England to translate from the Holy Scriptures at the time when he believed he was not perfect. King James was the most imperfect man, but he believed that the church needed to be separated. Now, you can say that he wanted to do what he wanted to do, so he created the Church of England so that he could have as many mistresses and wives as he wanted to have. Suffice it to say that in the translating from the Holy Scriptures, it brought clarity to some elements that you and I have become accustomed to. For instance, right here, I learned last night as I studied this, that where it says, for the bishop of one wife. The church at Rome interpreted that to say, for the bishop of no wife. What that did was set in place a series of events culturally in our world that we now have come to understand where the church itself is accused of having same-sex people. Because what did they translate it to say, for the bishop of no wife? So people assumed then that that meant that bishops and priests should not be married. Do you see why it caused confusion? Because it is not correct. Why is it erroneous? Let me tell you why. Because marriage 
was what? Ordained by God. So how on earth, how on earth was God going to call you to the office of being a priest and tell you you should not be married? Do you see? And then they say the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. If you go to first, I made some notes, first Corinthians, I'm going to tell you which scriptures you can go to for uh, reference. If you go to first Corinthians chapter nine and verse five, you can also go to first Timothy four and verse three, you will find where the Bible talks about marriage is ordained by God. That means that marriage is God putting man and woman together. You may not like it. You may disagree with it. Yes, have free will to disagree all you want, but marriage was ordained by God. So a bishop, an elder, a priest has to be what? Blameless. It means there no none of us should be able to point fingers at him because we saw him in the club clubbing or we saw him hanging out with people who accuse him of all kinds of nefarious things, including you know what? My daughter says I shouldn't say it, but you have seen the recent events. You would not, if you were a bishop and if you were called and following your calling, you would not be in that place where anyone could accuse you of anything. So you were wrong. And if you're a bishop, you're supposed to be blameless. So I, for instance, know that I am called to the office of being a minister of the gospel there are certain activities that I don't participate in. So you're not going to see me standing, blowing out a cigar anytime or smoking cigarettes anytime. Neither do you see me with a glass in my hand. If you see me at an event with a glass in my hand, that water is clear because there is water in there because I know that I have to do what? I have to be what? Say it. Blameless. The other thing that you don't see me doing, I'm sitting here in the office of minister, And guess what I'm not doing? You don't see me with a man. Do I have on a wedding ring? Have I come to you and said that I am Mrs. So-and-so? Until then, you're not going to see me cuddled up, fuddled up, unless somebody is going to put a ring on it. Why? Because one has to be blameless. It seems in our parlance today, we have forgotten this thing. We have forgotten what it means to be called by God. There is a lot of confusion around it because everybody wants a title. Everybody wants to be called brother, elder, bishop, apostle, clerk of this, that, and everything else. But nobody wants to do what is really called to do. Look at what it says. This is the Bible. Here is what it says. I can provide you with all the interpretations I want, but it says you should not be blameless. The husband and one wife having faithful children. Now, why should you have faithful children not given to insubordination and dissipation? Why? Because children are what? A reflection of what goes on in your house. So if you are acting crazy, and you are out there smoking and drinking, then your children are going to act just the same. That is not to say that there aren't children who are not disobedient and who are out there doing things contrary to what their parents want. But eventually, when it comes time, the children are going to stand what? Beside the parents. So what I have been observed and what I have been told is that people could tell what was when my children were younger. What they observed was that they could tell what goes on in my house by the behavior of my children publicly. When I used to go to church and walk into the church, into the house of God with my two children, they said my children would sit down and they behaved. They were not unruly. They were not insubordinate to authority. They did not talk back. Why? They said, that's how we know what's going on in your house, woman of God. Now they're grown. They're adults. It's up to them how they live. But the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should grow. And when he gets old, he shall not depart from it. To this day, even my own children, I'll tell you this. When they're saying certain things, my daughter wanted to say some things the other day. She thought she was going to run a track or something. And she said, mom, you cannot be there because the things I'm going to say are filthy. And you cannot be there. It would be disrespectful to you. You know what that is? Say, train up a child. In the way that he should grow. So much so they recognize and recognize and accept the office. That is what the Bible is saying. So you are supposed to instruct your children and you're supposed to guide them. 
So you shouldn't have children then who are out there running up and down and be drunk all over the place and be accused of sexually assaulting other people. That should not happen. If that is happening, that means the children know there's something going on in your house. Maybe you're not the bishop of one wife. Maybe there are side chicks and sidekicks and boyfriends and girlfriends and mistresses that the children know about. So they're like, that's just something my dad does. That's just something my mom does. That's not something that they live. Look at what the Bible says here. It says the bishop must not be self-willed nor quick-tempered. That means you mustn't be given to anger. So you can't be out there just telling people off. So you're, you're giving instructions to your staff and you're yelling at them. You are supposed to display temperance. That was something that Harriet, I'm going to be transparent to you. I had to learn. That was something that required patience. You see, I could not emerge until I was covered, until I was tempered. That is what the Bible says right there. It says a bishop should be a steward of God. Are we going to talk about that? You know what being a steward of God means? You're supposed to reflect what say godly attitudes and attributes. Come on now. So we should not be riding around here trying to reflect and trying to be like the next rap artist. Should we? Should we be standing on the stage and clubbing like we're in the club? Should we be inviting people into the house of God to have an event on watch night that traditionally was used as watch night, but we're going to just have a party? Should we be doing that? Should we? Should people not see us out in the crowd and people should say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that before you. To me, that's a mark of, of recognizing your spiritual authority. A bishop, an elder, a chief priest should be a steward of God. Now check this one out. Not given to wine. How did I say that? How much more should we say that? Not given to wine. Not given to drink, y'all. You should not be drunk. You should not be partying and drinking. Then you are not a bishop. Then you are not a leader. You're not a priest. It is clear. Why? Because it goes on to say that you should be sober-minded. That means you should have presence of your faculties. How can you be sober-minded if you're given to drink? If you are drunk? I did not write this. That's what the Bible says. And in today's world, people do not like this come to Jesus moment. People don't like this because that's why you don't hear it preached anymore. Because people are doing what they want to do. They want the money. So they go where the crowd is. So they say what the crowd wants instead of what the Bible says. And this is exactly why you were called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. So that you can show people the light. There has to be a difference. There has to be a line in the sand that we don't cross. There are some things that you have to put your foot down and say, I simply will not do. I simply am not going to drink. If you have been delivered from alcoholism, then you say, I am delivered. The reflection of that deliverance is what? Not taking it up. The temptation is there, of course. If Satan had already put the seed of drugs and alcoholism in you, I guarantee you, you will always be tempted that way. But if you are called out from it, you have the power to resist that addiction and resist that temptation. And if you're called into the office of serving God, you must show those attributes, those values. You must show those characteristics. The other thing it says is uh, not violent. So you should be supporting all the nonviolent movements. Remember Martin Luther King? Let's just use him as an example. What did Martin Luther King say? He said, I'm starting a nonviolent movement. We're not taking up arms. We're going to march until the society sees our plight and sober and just men will sit down and pass laws that will change the course of history. Did he not say that? I'm paraphrasing, but was that not his intention? What does the Bible say? You know, Martin Luther King, Dr. King, was a minister. Nobody ever questioned that. Because he reflected, he was the bishop of one wife. He was the leader of one wife. Amen? Amen. That is the office to which we're called. Now, the second thing is that 
You are to be sober-minded, not violent, not greedy for money. Can we talk about that? In your greed, we now need the world's validation. We want the world to see how important we are. Why is it so important to be validated? Why is it so important for people to say you are great and you are this? Why is that? Isn't it not enough for the people in the church to acknowledge you? Is that not what you are called to? Were you, I, you, I used to ask these questions like, are you a CEO of a corporation? No, you are a bishop. Stay in your lane. You're a priest, an elder. Stay in your lane for the love of all that is holy. Stay in your lane and be this. So they can't accuse you of anything else. Why are you constantly pursuing money? You need more money. You need to buy the biggest house. You have to drive Rolls Royces. You have to roll up in Bentleys. You have to be this avaricious Ferraris and all kinds of carriages, modern conveyances that you must have. Why? Taking money from the people. Your greed for money is what drove people out of the church. Because when you were taking the money, you built up establishments that glitters and gold. Oh, I have a 30,000 feet square feet facility that houses 6,000 people on any given Sunday. Look at you, greedy for money. Then you multiply. There were bishops who used to walk around this place and used to say, I collect a million dollars on a Sunday. I collect two million dollars on a Sunday. You hear what they were? They never said that I collect and brought to God two million souls or one million souls. They were counting up their money. What does it say right here? It says not being greedy for money. You should be hospitable. Oh, let's talk about that. I live in Michigan, Detroit in particular, and here it is cold. I didn't see none of you all open. We had a cold spell recently. Did any of you open your churches to take in the homeless, the unhoused, the people who had nowhere else to go? Did you turn on your heat and your lights to take them in? Did you offer the ministry of helps to the people? Maybe you don't live in Detroit, Michigan, but you live somewhere else where it rained recently where there was a hurricane. A pastor in one of these states recently tried to do that and the town, the the, the establishment turned on him. They literally arrested the man for opening up his church to the unhoused. What have we become? You know why these things can happen now? Because pastors have been acting badly. So nobody believes in the reverence of the pastorate and the reverence of the man of God. The Bible continues that you should be holy, just, and self-controlled. Holy. If you're displaying the qualities of holiness, then they're not going to doubt that you're a man of God. But if they see you down on Cass Corridor or see your car, one of the cars you drive down on Cass Corridor, or see you exiting somebody else's house when you should be at home with your wife, then they know you are no longer holy. Amen. You should be self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word. Be self-controlled and holy and just. So when people go into your office with complaints, you should be just. You should not be telling women who have been beaten, who come to you and say, my husband is beating me up. Don't tell them to go back and submit to the same man who is trashing them around the room and thrashing them all over the place. People come into your office and tell you that their children are being sexually assaulted by the persons living in their house. Be just and say, no, we can't have that. There must be a separation. Find resources. All the money you collect on a Sunday is supposed to help the people. Put it aside to help the people so the people, when they come, they can find help. Change the course of how this thing is going so irreverently and unholy and people running up and down and accusing pastors of this and that. I'm making people like me, when we say we are preaching the gospel, people look us up and down like you next. I wonder what I'm going to find out about you. Come on, we need to change this and change it around and put it back where it was. Look at what it says. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That means you speak the truth of the gospel. You come here and you tell the people, 
Thus and thus saith the Lord, take them into the scriptures and show them this is how we are supposed to live. This is what we are supposed to do. Live by it. So what are you going to do? You're going to have to, you want to call yourself a bishop. You want to call yourself an apostle. You want to call yourself that. You're going to have to give up some of them carriages you've been rolling around in. You're going to have to go back to God and give up all that lifestyle. That was never reflective of God. Some of you look like pimps in the pulpit, dressing like I don't know what. And then you took off your pimp robes and you start dressing like the rest. Well, well, we're just going to be casual around here. So you start dressing like rappers with your pants all the way hanging down and have on your hoodies stepping up into the pulpit and call yourselves holy. Where were you last night? Who were you hanging out with? Because the, the congregation knows you. They know when you go to visit her over there. They know when you go to visit him. They do know. The people are just desperate for God and they're actually watching to see what you're going to do about it. So it concludes here in verse number nine that you should be giving sound doctrine. And this is the whole reason why you are called. You ready for this? Guess what you're going to be held accountable for? Guess. You're going to be held accountable for the people who need to hear the truth and you they don't hear it from you. So you don't tell them what God says because you believe that you shouldn't. I tell you the honest truth. This is it. You must bring people to God to draw people to God and to persuade them according to the true word of the faith. That is your holy and just calling. That is the standard that you should exhort. The honest truth is I am humbled myself. This is why I take you into the scriptures to show you so you can read it for yourself. Right here on the screen, the scripture is running. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. You can read it yourself. You can see yourself where this is. And when you have read it yourself, now you know that this is the reason. Now you know that this is the calling. That's your calling. So this may not be for everybody. Maybe somebody sitting out there right now and contemplating that I feel a call. I feel an unction. I feel that I'm called to this. These are the characteristics that you're to embody. These are the characteristics that you must display. It's not about putting on a three-piece suit and some shoes that match your suit. It's not about going to take out a loan to buy the biggest building in the community, nor to go buy the Bentleys, the Rolls Royce, and all the carriages. It's not about to be on the most famous uh, radio station in town. That was never what this was about. In fact, we're supposed to be in direct contradiction to that. There has to be a standard so that the people know, well, I'm out here doing this. I'm pretty sure it's not in the word of God for me to do it. But over here, that's what I aspire to be. Over here, this is where I'm called to be. That's what we are supposed to do. And when we have done that, we are fulfilling what Titus chapter 1 verses 5 to 9 says. So let me pray with you. I pray for all of us that under these leaders that we have seen, that God will perform a deliverance. In the name of Jesus, Father, we ask you to deliver us from erroneous leadership. Take us out of it and move in those people whom you have called to be here. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Be blessed, everybody.